Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second day of talks at Academy 2022. My name is Hector Martin, and I've been a Linux user and KD user for uh, over 20 years now. And I've also been hacking on embedded devices um, almost as long and uh, messing around with weird hardware. So I'm afraid I couldn't be here with you today physically at the venue, but um, I'm giving this talk remotely, and uh, we will be having a live Q&A session at the end, so uh, please do stick around. So um, I'm going to be talking about a little project of mine that is called Asahi Linux. You may have heard of it. And uh, instead of giving you the marketing blurb, let's just go straight to a uh, demo. So if you have, does anyone have uh, one of those Apple Silicon, um, you know, fancy new Macs that uh, Apple released in 2020 and later? Yeah, so if you have one of those, you can pull up on macOS, you can pull up a terminal and just type in this command here. And after you follow a few simple instructions and reboot a couple of times and follow a few wizard steps, you will find yourself at a fully functional Plasma desktop environment that you can use on your Mac, ARM64, Apple Silicon machine. So we have working Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, the multi-touch trackpad works. Um, you can use the SD card reader on the models that have that. We have uh, battery statistics. The USB 2 mode on the USB ports works. Uh, USB 3 works on the Type A ports and system that, uh, systems that have those. Uh, the headphone jack works on the latest kernels. And uh, work is in progress on USB 3 DisplayPort and Thunderbolt on the Type-C ports. There's some very good news this week from Sven. Uh, he just got uh, DisplayPort output working a couple days ago. Um, and we also are working on the speakers, which are actually working but need some user space tooling and safety stuff to, be, to sound good and be uh, safe so that you can't blow the, the speakers. Also, we're working on the GPU and some other very good news this week. Um, our developer, Zahilina, got the GPU to boot up a GNOME environment, um, you know, fully uh, hardware accelerated, and you can use Firefox, you can use GNOME apps, and you can use KDE apps. I hear the only reason that uh, you can't actually start Plasma yet is that XORG doesn't work, and Plasma has a hard dependency on next Wayland still, even in Wayland mode, um, but I'm sure we can get that fixed up. So uh, it's working, it's, uh, it's looking pretty good. We're also working on sleep mode, so... Uh, yeah, um, you get, even without uh, sleep mode, you get upwards of 16 hours of battery life just idling on Linux with the lid closed. And uh, the best part is that you don't need any jailbreaks, you don't need any weird hacks. Uh, this is all fully supported on the platform. And, uh, you know, you can install it and be confident that it's going to keep working and you can use it as your main machine and you can do a boot with macOS. So we're going to talk about how we got there. Um, if uh, we go back to November 24, 2020, um, that was a little bit after Apple... Uh, released these new machines. And um, yeah, at the time, you know, that it, uh, it was a completely new hardware platform, which only supported Mac OS. And there was an article um, on that date by uh, Linus Torvalds. And he said, the main problem with the M1 for me is the GPU and other devices around it, because it wouldn't have any Linux support unless Apple opens up. And that's what he said at the time. And if you fast forward to uh, July 31, 2022, Linus Torvalds released the Linux kernel 5.19 from an Apple M1 MacBook Air, sorry, Apple M2 MacBook Air running our downstream kernel patches. <laughs> All right, let's talk about how we got here. So in the beginning, uh, quite a few years ago, Apple obviously decided to move to ARM64, and they started with the iOS architecture, which had been using ARM64 for several years now. So they were um, using Intel for their MacBook uh, hardware on their Macs, and I guess it wasn't you know, meeting their expectations. They wanted to move to an in-house architecture. Um, but how do you turn an iPhone into a Mac? Because an iPhone is a locked down device. Um, you know, they can only run a single OS version. You cannot downgrade them. You have to phone home to, uh, in, you know, flash the new firmware so you can only use the latest version. Um, but they are very secure and robust. So, that, you know, that's a plus. There's, uh, there's good reasons to, uh, to own an iPhone. I think it's the most secure hardware platform in existence right now for consumers. Um, but, you know, if you want a Mac, developers expect Macs to do things like support having multiple macOS versions installed, so you can test software on different versions. And uh, kernel developers expect to be able to run and debug kernel extensions, or, you know, that's like kernel modules for macOS. So, you know, um, if you look at Macs until that point, they had been using EFI as a bootloader, and uh, that gave you an open boot environment, effectively, where you could install whatever you want. Um, but EFI is kind of a security nightmare. Um, you know, EFI is like a whole operating system all unto itself. It can run drivers from, you know, ROMs inside hardware devices that are attached. It, it has a huge attack surface with like USB support and all this crazy stuff and networking and graphics and all that. And it's been the source of a lot of security vulnerabilities on, um, you know, x86 based machines to this date. So Apple didn't want to use EFI. And instead they went ahead and said, okay, we're gonna take the iOS version. We're gonna take the iOS design 
um, and we're going to instead add stuff to it until it is something that we can use on a Mac. And so they came up with this thing called boot policy. And what that does is it basically lets you install multiple Mac OS instances on a single Mac. Um, the boot process is still basically the same as you know, an iPhone, but there's this actual layer that lets you, you know, select between different OSs. And um, the cool thing is that for every single OS install, there are three security modes. And one of them, the first one is called full security, and that's basically the same as iOS. It does the phone home thing where you install a new uh, OS version, and it's you know, fully locked down. You basically can't, you can't even install third-party kernel extensions. Um, but it's the most secure mode if that's what you care about and you trust Apple. Uh, and then there's a mode called reduce security, which lets you install unsigned software and uh, third-party kernel extensions, but it, you know, it's still somewhat locked down. But most interestingly, there is a mode called permissive security. And permissive security mode can run untrusted operating systems, but you still need to authorize them as the user of the machine. So it's not like it's you know, turning the machine into an insecure, you know, uh, secure boot off EFI machine. It's actually more secure even in permissive security mode than probably any EFI machine today, just because the firmware is uh, you know, a lot less complicated. And because of this uh, you know, um, authorization process, it's actually user controlled. The user decides what they want to install in their machine, and that's really important. So permissive security, if we quote uh, Apple's documentation on this, they say permissive security also provides an architectural capability for running an arbitrary, fully untrusted operating system kernel. And there's a little asterisk here at the bottom saying important, Apple doesn't provide or support custom XNU kernels. Um, XNU is the macOS kernel, and it is actually open source. So when uh, this came out, just a, I think it was about a month later, uh, after the release of the machines, there was a blog post that showed up, um, and it, you know, it was a blog post telling you step-by-step -step instructions on how to compile and run your own XNU kernel on one of these Apple Silicon machines. Uh, and if you look at the uh, author of this blog post, you'll find that it was uh, Jeremy Andres, who at the time was the kernel engineering manager at Apple. So yeah, they, they don't provide or support the kernels, but at least the engineers uh, clearly think this is a good idea. So. If we can install multiple OSs in different security levels, which is really cool, by the way, and with custom kernels, can we put Linux on it? Uh, if you dig around Jeremy's website a little bit, you'll see that there in a the little corner, it says, I am a historical fan, user, and hacker of the Linux operating system. So uh, yeah, Jeremy probably thinks this is a good idea. Let's, uh, let's give it a shot. This is a really interesting situation because Apple is basically saying, okay, you can boot whatever you want, and you know we, basically promise that you can boot whatever you want. This is part of the uh, design of the system. It's engineered to be like this, but we're not going to port Linux for you. We're not going to give you any documentation. We're not going to help you at all. Have fun. And this is really something that has never happened on any platform uh, to this day. Because if you look at platforms that have you know, Linux running on them, it's either officially supported or it's something like Android, which is originally Linux anyway. And uh, so using, an, you know, Third-party OS on those, uh, on like Android phones, is more of an integration job than you know porting from a scratch job. It's so much similar with things like consumer routers, which you know usually don't have uh, that. Manufacturers usually don't condone third-party OSs, but they do allow it, and they don't really sign their builds or you know lock everything down to make that impossible. Um, but then you know you can usually get the kernel source and all that. So this is very interesting because it's like a brand new platform that is completely unsupported, other than the CPU. And yet, it, you know, the manufacturer is saying, feel free to put whatever you want on it, but we're not going to help you. So how do you put Linux on this kind of platform 101? I'm going to give you a uh, four-step guide to how to make something like uh, Sahi Linux possible and successful. Step one is to realize that this is a big project. Um, so I've done Linux ports to weird hardware before. I put Linux on a PS4. And one thing I know is that um, you know, if you're doing this as a hobby on your spare time, you might get a tech demo out, but there's a very big difference between a tech demo and something that is stable, well-supported, and upstreamable into the Linux kernel and actually getting upstreamed. Um, so I knew that you know, if I was just going to be working on this on, on the weekends in my spare time, it was never going to get anywhere. Um, and even as a full-time job, I would need uh, other people's help to uh, make this a reality. So I said, okay, are there enough people actually interested in this to let me turn this into a full-time job? And so I asked Twitter, you know, would you support this kind of effort? And if you look at the numbers, if you look at the percentages and the like vote counts there and the, you know, the do the math, don't worry about the, you know, the relative winner or anything. But if you do the math, 
you'll see that uh, it works out even if you factor in, you know, a lot of uh, overhead. So I was, I was very surprised and pleased by that. So I said, okay, let's give it a shot. And I opened up a Patreon and later a GitHub sponsors. And honestly, the response has been incredible. Um, I'm very grateful that uh, so many people think that, um, you know, this is something worth doing and worth supporting and that they trust me to, uh, to push it forward. So with that, you know, um, with uh, enough funding to turn this into a job and not just, you know, like a spare time project, uh, it's time to see how we make it a reality. Now, I've been working on uh, embedded systems and hacking stuff uh, for a long time. And one thing that I've learned is that the most important part to make it a success, um, besides the time, is the tooling. Because uh, every hour that you spend working on tooling is you know, going to save you many, many hours after that in, um, in development. So uh, if we start at the beginning and see what we get on a Mac, if you open up the man page for a tool called kmutil on one of these machines, um, there is a command that is kmutil configure boot, and it is described as configure a custom boot object policy. This command can be used to install a custom macO file. A macO is the executable format for macOS, from which the system will boot. So there you go. There you have it. This is the insert your own kernel here um, command. and um, how do we go from here to being able to reverse engineer you know, a complicated system like this? So what I did um, is start using some existing tooling that I have and improve it. Because um, if I know one thing from my Wii days and um, you know, how I did reverse engineering back then is that not just for myself, but also when you have other people helping you, there's a big difference between having you know, a system where every time you want to try a new binary or a new version of something or a new experiment, you have to reboot and spend five minutes, you know, juggling SD cards. And a system where I can tell someone, hey, if you help me with this, um, the reboot cycle is seven seconds and you have this interactive shell where you can run things in real time against the system and mess around with everything and, uh, you know, upload kernels and do all kinds of crazy stuff. That's a really big help both for myself and to get other people interested. So from those wee days, I took a tool that is called Mini, which was um, both a sort of kernel and um, experimentation tool for the Wii uh, security CPU, which is an ARM32. I ported it to ARM64 and renamed it Mini, spelled M1N1. And uh, yeah, when Mini started, when I started running this on an, my first Apple Silicon machine, uh, it was really just a very dumb remote control proxy, basically. It was, um, it, you plugged into the Mac through a serial port because there's a sort of secret serial mode on the Type-C ports. Uh, so if you have some special hardware for that, you can get a serial console, and then if you install Mini, it would let you remotely control and read and write memory from a host machine. That was how it started. These days, it's actually the first stage bootloader for Asahi Linux, so it's what you get if you just install it. But if you enable the proxy mode, you get a USB-based proxy, and uh, you can experiment with this from a host machine using a very, very full-featured Python uh, tool set. So what this Python shell allows you to do is, um, you know, at the lowest level, you can read and write memory and I.O. registers, of course. Uh, but you can also parse Apple's device tree to get metadata about which devices exist. And because it's Python, it makes it very, very easy to both experiment in real time and write scripts to test things about the hardware or effectively write prototype drivers in Python. So some of the things you can do are, you know, simply flip a bit to enable an interrupt, for example. That's just one right. But you can also ask it to power on this device and all um, parent devices that uh, require uh, power in order, in order for this device to work. Or you can even say, OK, please establish a communications channel to the system management controller on the machine and ask it what, uh, how much battery charge is left. Um, so like, these are some of the you know, like abstraction levels at which you can, uh, you can talk to the machine with this tool set. And of course, you can also load uh, kernels over USB. So if you're working on Linux, you can just upload a new kernel in the NetRamFS over USB. It only takes a few seconds. And the, the test cycle is like seven seconds to reboot the machine back into USB mode, and then a few seconds to load the new kernel. So yeah, it doesn't matter if you crash the machine. You don't have to mess around with reloading modules or trying not to crash the box. You just reboot every time, and it's fine. Like Even if you crash it, by the time you've looked at the code and figured out what you want to do next, the machine has rebooted. So it doesn't matter. Uh, and Mini can also reload itself for updates. So you don't even basically ever have to reflash it after you flash it once. And you can add as many features as you want and just do a little extra fast reload step before you want to use them. So that's all really cool. But 
Uh, Mini's biggest feature and most important tool is that it is also a hypervisor and it can run both Mac OS or Linux or really anything else as a guest in a VM. But this VM isn't really the kind of VM that you're used to um, in an OS where you have virtual hardware um, that the guest sees and it you know, has nothing to do with the host. This is a bare bones, you know, very thin VM that actually passes through the, all the real hardware. So the guest, even though it's running in a VM, effectively thinks it's running on bare metal and runs all the same bare metal um, drivers and everything else. So when you run macOS on this, um, you're using the same macOS kernel binary that you would normally boot bare metal on the machine, which is not what you would use if you're running a VM of macOS in macOS, which Apple supports, because that uses a special macOS kernel that is built for VMs. But this runs the real macOS kernel. And uh, the one virtual peripheral it gives you is a virtual serial port. So all you have to do is plug in a USB cable, no special hardware, and you get a debug serial port out of it. Um, but then, of course, because it's a hypervisor, you can use it to debug the guest. So, of course, uh, you can pause the guest and you know get back traces and load symbol files. And there's even a GDB server mode. So you can plug in a GDB instance to it and use GDB with all of its uh, features to debug something. Um, and though there's like that's not even the most important part because the killer feature of this hypervisor is that since it sits between the OS and the hardware, even though it's passing through the hardware, it can snoop on all of that communications. So um, the mini hypervisor lets you trace any hardware or memory accesses that you want and feed that data uh, into Python. And then your Python scripts running on the host machine, which again, are very easy to write, can do whatever they want with it. And so what we do to reverse engineer these machines is that we start a Mac OS guest in the hypervisor and we log what it's doing with the hardware and we figure things out step by step. So if we do that and we tell the hypervisor to trace every single read and write to the display controller, uh, we will find you know, a giant list of, uh, of hex uh, numbers and uh, memory addresses. And if we just sort of look at the addresses and the pattern that is going on there, uh, you know, over time we can deduce that this is a mailbox protocol because it's mostly writing and reading the same registers. And so then we can describe those registers in Python, something like this. And when we run that in the hypervisor, then we get a verbose description of all the registers being written, written which is really cool. But okay, now we're staring at these mailbox messages and we can realize that uh, on top of that, Apple built a protocol called RTKit, which is the name of their firmware OS. And it has the standard for you know, like initializing and sending out syslogs and stuff like that. So uh, we can you know, reverse engineer this and build a tracer for it. And uh, once all of that is done, then we get all these um, you know, system messages pretty printed. And we can even see syslogs from the, um, from the display controller. And then looking at some of the extra data that's going through, and again, digging deeper, we can find and figure out that actually Apple runs a remote procedure call interface, sending buffers of data back and forth uh, between the OS and the display controller firmware. Um, and so we can figure that out and uh, have the Python site read memory to dump all of those buffers. And we get you know, a dump of uh, hex dumps of messages. And uh, then we, if we dig deeper into that, we'll find that actually it's a remote procedure call interface that basically calls C++ methods. So uh, when we figure out how these are marshaled and how the arguments are passed and all of that stuff, now we have a trace of every single function call and callback between the OS and the display controller firmware. And yes, this is crazy, ridiculously complicated, and uh, you know I have no idea what Apple was thinking, but this is how we can reverse engineer this stuff. We build the layers in Python. And all this is done using Python scripts on the host machine, which can be live reloaded. So you don't even have to reboot the guest if you mess up, if the Python you know, throws an exception, you can fix it, reload it, and keep going. And you can debug it. And you know if it does crash, it's not that bad to reboot the guest anyway. Um, Mini has a lot of other goodies besides this. It has, uh, you can build and upload um, assembly or C code snippets to the target if you want to, um, you know, just run something bare metal. You can tell it to watch memory ranges and report any changes uh, visually, you know, color coded. You can even have uh, declarative definitions of structures in memory for complicated stuff like the GPU. This is based on Python construct, but it's, it has more features. You can even diff these structures so you can see, oh, this field changed from this to that. Uh, and there's even a logic analyzer for GPIOs and memory locations. So if you're messing with like SPI or S2C, you can see what the pins are doing and or you can see what the registers or other memory locations are doing. There's, there's really a lot of uh, cool features like this. And it's all of this tooling that makes all of this reverse engineering possible. So with the tooling in hand, let's move on to step three, which is recruiting more people. Um, 
what I've found when dealing with kind of this kind of project is that if you make it interesting, people will come. And my approach to this is that, okay, if you want to uh, help us out, you can work on whatever you want, and I'll just work on things nobody else is working on. Um, you do have to learn to delegate and trust your fellow developers, uh, because there's no way you can micromanage anything, and it's no fun if you try to do that. Um, but it does help that these are cool machines, so you know, people are interested in, uh, in hacking with them and, uh, and messing around with the hardware and figure the, uh, figuring these things out. Another thing is that you need to keep the community uh, welcoming and inclusive because it's no fun if people, you know, just don't feel like they belong or, you know, are not having a good time here. And there is a bit of a, an art to community management I found. That could be a whole talk on itself, but um, it's something you pick up after kind of doing this for a while. And I have some experience being sort of a de facto somewhat community lead in the we homebrew scene. So, yeah, be aware of that, that, you know, there, there is some finesse to, uh, to, you know, leading this kind of project. And, but yeah, you know, um, people are different and you have to learn to work with, uh, with people and uh, make them all work together. And another thing is that this will take more of your time than you expect. I honestly, I think I spend more time talking to people these days than actually writing code. And that's fine. That's just sort of the, uh, the, way, uh, the way it goes with these projects. Um, but it's always important to, you know, keep people together and everyone, uh, you know, happy and, and working on what they want to work on. Sometimes you do have to put your foot down if something is going wrong, but hopefully you know that doesn't happen too often. Just be aware if it does. But yeah, if you if you make it fun for everyone, uh, things will uh, things will work out. It helps if you can get experienced folks and maintainers hooked. Um, early on, we uh, ended up with uh, Mark Zinger from the Linux ARM 64 KVM fame. Um, so he did our PCI Express driver and some IRQ on KVM changes that we needed to. Um, to make this whole thing work with the uh, with the Linux kernel, um, but also recently Russell King, the original ARM Linux maintainer, uh, started helping us upstream stuff, which is really cool. We also have um, Melissa Rosenzweig, who is the Panfrost driver developer for Mesa, uh, which is a reverse engineered ARM Mali driver, and she is now writing the reverse engineered Apple M1 driver for Mesa. Uh, and then we also have some other cool kernel people in the IRC channels. We have Rob Herring and Arn Berkman. Uh, they also work on related embedded stuff for Linux, and it's really cool just having them, uh, you know, around to ask questions and and help out. Oh, and uh, Mark Tennis from the OpenBSD project is leading the OpenBSD port to the M1, and also uh, doing the U-boot port because we use U-boot as one of the bootloaders in a boot chain. Uh, it's kind of complicated, <laughs> but uh, yeah, U-boot is one of the core pieces there, and uh, Mark is uh, is doing that, so it's, that's also really cool. You can actually boot OpenBSD. Even official OpenBSD actually is uh, supported on the M1 faster than any other distribution of Linux. So um, that's really cool. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to some of the Asahi devs. Um, Sven is a fr good friend of mine, and he works on USB, external displays, and other uh, crazy Apple stuff like custom CPU features. Um, Jan Grinnell is hacking on the display controller, IOMMUs, device trees, and input devices, and more. We also have Mark Nutin Povicer. I don't know if I pronounced that right. But he's single-handedly doing all of the kernel audio work, um, including a bunch of new drivers. Um, and we have James Caligaris, who is building the user space audio stuff. And he's like a proper scientist. He takes like calibrated you know, measurements of the speakers and everything. And we need this and a lot of work on the user space side, because it turns out that Linux audio is still not quite there for uh, you know, modern machines. So there's uh, quite a lot of work to do to uh, you know, make it something that people would want to use. And, uh, and Lena is writing the GPU kernel driver uh, for these machines, and she's doing it in Rust, so it's probably going to be the first, you know, sort of really complicated Rust driver now that Rust support is uh, getting merged into the Linux kernel in just a few weeks, probably. And uh, I also hear, oh yeah, she, as I mentioned, she did get GNOME uh, working uh, just this week, so things are progressing quite nicely. And I heard that she's giving a talk with Alyssa at XDC next week, so if you're interested in the GPU stuff, you should watch that. And uh, finally, I need to give a shout out to Joy Goli, who is helping out with GPIO and Rust stuff, but he's also just the nicest guy ever, helps out all the newbies, you know, talks with everyone on IRC, is always helping everyone else out. You need people like that too. Like, we need more people like Joy. All right, so uh, once you have a community and you have some tooling, finally, step four is to make it look good. Uh, because if you have this kind of project and you are gonna be getting some, you know, press coverage and that kind of stuff, for better or for worse, it's, um, you know, it helps if you have uh, logos and things like that. But also you need to make the actual product look good because it's no fun if, um, if uh, you know, pe users need to follow like a 20 page wiki document in order to install all this. So 
uh, what we did is we built a user-friendly text mode installer. And um, this has to actually set up a whole sort of fake Mac OS partition so that the bootloader recognizes this as an OS that it can boot. It's kind of complicated because it's not really designed for third-party OSs, even though like it's allowed, it, like the, you know, the, the design of the um, requirements for the setup of an OS is very much tailored for Mac OS, so we have to work with that. And uh, so we have to reverse engineer all that. We made the installer do all of that automatically for you, so the users don't have to worry about that. And uh, once you get the machine installed, it uh, and it downloads a you know Linux image for you. We ship those plasma images, and um, yeah, once you get it installed, um, you get as I said a KDE plasma desktop and a Calamaris based first time setup wizard. But there's also uh, some other nice things like um, we have some tweaks uh, to like pre-configure the touchpad so it works like you expect in a MacBook. And the keyboard layout is automatically detected uh, on the MacBooks, so you don't even have to think about that. And also high DPI is automatically turned on on the MacBooks and turned on on the desktops if you have a display that has enough resolution. So it's, you know, it's, it's these, little de uh, these little details that help make it feel like the OS belongs on these machines and isn't just something you know, foreign that you installed and have to like, configure anything, everything by hand. And I think these things matter, right? For first time users and people kind of thinking, to, trying to figure out if this is usable or not, that you make these things work out of the box and it feels like you know, a polished pro product, even though it doesn't actually take that much time to, to do these things. Another thing we did is that we future-proofed it. We have some meta packages so that when we add support for new hardware, users can just upgrade their system and everything just works. So we first tried this when we added Bluetooth support because that required some extra firmware copying and um, some daemons had to be enabled and you know, some things configured. And uh, you know, we did that with the meta packages. And in the end, any previous existing user could just update their packages, reboot their machine, and they get a Bluetooth icon in the taskbar. And uh, you know, I also think that's very important because you know you have these early adopters, and you don't want to make this a you know a drag for them to have to keep adding things in order to make it work. It's so much cooler if it just like magically works. You update, and your system gets better. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, marketing matters. So you know, kind of cool logo, website, all that stuff. Uh, it does help. And finally, um, you need to care about your users. This is also something that I learned from the Wii days. So not just make their lives easy, but make sure they don't destroy their machines, make sure they don't break something in a way, you know, accidentally in a way that, um, you know, they couldn't have predicted. We can't stop people from deleting their partitions, obviously. But, um, you know, that's why, for example, we have had the speakers disabled on these machines, even though they have technically worked for months now, because we need to have a safety and EQ model that we know um, you know, prevents users from destroying them by setting the volume too high. And this turns out to actually be a difficult problem. So we're still working on that. And until we're confident that you can't destroy them, we're going to keep them disabled. Um, and also for USB-based recovery, uh, Apple provides a tool to recover these machines over USB. And we have an equivalent tool called iDevice Restore. Um, that already existed a long time ago. I was actually somewhat involved with parts of that way, way, you know, over 10 years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, we made sure that you know actually works for these uh, brand new uh, Macs, not just iPhones like it originally uh, was meant for. And that means that if you do screw up one of these machines, if you quote brick it, but not really, then you can just plug into another machine. It could be a Linux machine, doesn't have to be a Mac, and hold down some keys, run some commands, and then your machine is back to life. Um, you'll notice that I haven't talked about the actually writing the drivers part, and that's because. Um, you know, people think that's the most important part, but actually the most important parts are everything, you know, these four steps that I've just mentioned. If you can get these things right, actually writing the code, it sort of comes naturally, right? But if you don't have a good community, if you don't have good tooling, if you don't, you know, have a, you know, polished user experience, then you're not going to be able to succeed as a project that is aiming to, you know, offer a real OS that people might actually want to use on a machine like this. So, assuming you've followed steps one through four and you've got some uh, hardware support you want to show off, finally, step five is to just release. Um, you should be prepared for an avalanche of users. Uh, it's, it, I think I spent the first uh, couple of weeks after our first um, alpha release just fixing endless installer bugs or like you know 16 or 18 releases and uh, things like, oh, it doesn't work on four terabyte systems due to a timeout because the SSD takes longer to come up. There's going to be crazy stuff that you couldn't foresee. So be aware of that. Make sure you get some sleep. Um, but uh, yeah, if you get there, congratulations. That's how you launch a reverse engineering operating system port project. And 
there you have it. That's the story of how Asahi Linux came to be. There's still a lot of stuff to do. Um, you know, as I said, we're working on USB 3 Thunderbolt, DisplayPort, the speakers, the GPU, so much stuff happening. And I'm pretty confident that in the next few months, you know, before the end of the year, we're going to have a lot more cool stuff to show off. But uh, even so, today it's actually usable as a daily driver for a lot of people, depending on what you're doing with it. Linus Torvalds used it on his trip. And um, yeah, um, I hope uh, you uh, enjoy the presentation. And if you have a Mac, I hope you give it a try. Um, and um, I will be taking questions and answers now. So thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Thank you very much, Hector. Um, do we have any questions from the audience here? So when will you consider it done? I mean, these things are never done, right? Like, um, they're gonna keep releasing new machines. We're gonna have, you know, work cut out for us for a while, I think. But, um, I mean, it, when is it done is really a question for like the individual user, right? Because, um, you know, if you're just interested in like, you know, browsing, using an SSH client, uh, using the CPU, building stuff on it, that kind of stuff, it's already good enough for that. Um, you know, if you want uh, 3D acceleration to run the desktop more smoothly, then that's going to come a bit later. If, uh, you know, um, you want sleep mode, that's also coming soon. Um, but, you know, if you want the neural engine to work, that's probably going to take longer because there's a lot fewer people interested in that. So, yeah, I mean, these things are never done, 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 right, <laughs> is, uh, is all I can say. But I do hope that over time, you know, more and more people consider it done enough that they can just make it their main machine. So uh, it looks like Apple was nice enough to add this unsecure boot mode. Uh, is that something that they can remove at some point and then we are all screwed? Um, I don't think that it's realistic to expect them to remove it from existing machines because first of all, that would probably be illegal because a certain other company tried that and got sued for it. Um, but, um, you know, it's also terrible marketing and the, you know, they actually put a lot of development work into making this possible. And they have word from Apple employees that like, this is official company policy, right? So like technically they could remove it. Um, I don't think that's actually going to happen. Hi. Um, given that now iPhones and Macs are kind of hardware-wise quite similar, is there like any reason why you think that like iPhones are still like super locked down, while on MacBooks you can just unlock them and you can install whatever you want on them? Um, so I think Apple kind of sees the two product lines as different um, in some fundamental ways. Uh, I don't know exactly what like the rationale is for um, you know for the very different um, like security models that they have, but um, like there's you know Macs have always been open and um, iPhone devices have always been closed and I guess it's not really about the hardware but it's more about the product line. Uh, so I would love to have an, you know boot policy on an iPad with the M1 because like that would be amazing, uh, but. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 kind of a management decision at Apple, right? Um, I don't know what's in their heads. <laughs> Any other questions? Nothing online as well. So thank you very much, Hector. Thank you very much. <laughs>